Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Praise God to study the Word of God and to worship His name, to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. So we gather together. Uh, this morning, I'm going to uh, be, we're, be finishing up, uh, hopefully finish up 1 John chapter 2. Uh, we're going to begin with verse 28. Verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2. Verse 28. Um, and he says here, if, if everybody turn to your Bibles, 1 John 2, 28. And he says here, And now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I'm going to read that again. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That tells me some are going to be ashamed when he comes. <laughs> Doesn't that? That's, that's a very sobering statement, isn't it? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dave, you want to say that? I did. Some will discard him and some will be glad he's coming. Yeah, yeah. We want to be among those that will be glad of his, his soon return. We're always, we're always looking and waiting for it, you know. That's sad. That's really sad. But there are all those that will be, be ashamed. You know, that to me, I read that scripture, and that should be our daily prayer, if you think about it. Our daily prayer, Lord, Help me to abide in you that when you shall appear, I won't be ashamed because I'm always looking for your coming. I don't want to do anything that, would, that comes between me and him. We want to have everything steer clear of anything, any sin or anything that we have that obstru obstructing, obstructing our fellowship with him. We want it out of the way. Am I right? Amen. Amen. So we don't, want to think, we don't want to be living in sin, habitual. We're not sinlessly perfect. There's no such thing as sinless perfection, but we don't habitually walk in it either. And I really believe, and, I, and I've, I've, as I studied this, this book, this First John, I'm, I'm of the conviction that uh, of a person who says he's a Christian, but he's constantly living in sin, he's not saved. No, that's right. Exactly. You know? And, and I, that's, it's pretty evident to me. Right. You, you have the Holy Spirit. Right. right. Is the Holy Spirit not going to convict you? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you have the Holy Spirit when you got born again. Right? The Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. That's how the Bible, you can't come unless the Spirit which sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. We talked about that last week or Wednesday night. So we can't be, unless the Holy Spirit draws us, or we can't come to the saving knowledge of Christ. So, oh, I, I got, I, he's got one. I gave it to him. So he says here, <clears throat> and now little children. I read that, I've counted five times that, those two words in, the, in his beginning of the Gospel of John, 1 John. This is the fifth time he refers to us as little children. That's a, that's a term of endearment to me. He loves us. Just like he calls us beloved little children. But this is the fifth time he refers to us as little children. And that's... Uh, that's a rare, that's like a father loving his child. Abide in him, that when he shall appear, well, that's, that phrase right there tells us we ought to be in condition of fruit bearing. And, uh, huh? John 15, yeah, bearing fruit and, and, being, and uh, we want to be always ready to his coming. We're bearing fruit and walking in close fellowship with him. As well as, and we need to be in the condition of being ready as well. So he says here, what we were, what, we, what he's saying is what we were before, say, last week or a month before, we need to be always leaning on the cross daily. You know, we're to, what we were six months ago will not suffice. We need to always lean on the cross, the finished work of Calvary, deny ourselves and take up the cross daily, Luke 9, 23 says. We're to look exclusively to Christ and Him crucified. Because that's where the benefit of the cross, we have received the benefits of the finished work of Calvary. 
we're, we're to renew our faith daily in that, the finished work of Calvary. Because I guarantee you that Satan will see to it. If you don't do it, he'll have your faith in other things other than the finished work of Calvary. That's how he works. That's why I, I've said so many times, the object of your faith, you have to hold on to that like a bulldog. I mean, just like a pit bull. Hold on to that thing. And don't let go of it. You know, because he'll ever try to move us away from, the, from Calvary. On a something, your object of faith is something else which will bring on disaster in your life. It, so we want to be living in close fellowship with the Lord, uh, constantly abiding in Him so that we may be ready for His appearing. Amen? 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 And so that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. This speaks of the heart attitude of the believer. We're to live so close to the Lord, there's nothing between us and Him. But just like I said earlier, there's no, no, nothing of known sin in our lives. And if, we, if we're, and it's brought to our attention, we need to get rid of it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's for the believer. Now, sometimes I've, I've read tr gospel tracts that, that say that's how the, the sinner gets saved. No, that's for the believer. First John is for the believer, not for the unbeliever. Right. Because we're not, we're not perfect. We're not sinlessly perfect. And so we rely on that. Uh, so there's no way a sinner can confess all his sins. I couldn't confess all my sins. I couldn't remember how, all of them. Yeah, and I'll tell you who teaches that false teaching. Joseph Prince. I didn't know that. He teaches that, this, that we, once you come to know Christ as Savior, you don't need to repent of your sins anymore. And I'm telling you, this is the hyper-grace gospel. Yeah. But yet... We are, when we walk with him, he convicts us of our sins because you've got to remember, did, did Jesus not get on his disciples when they got out of line? Or did he say, listen, you know, remember he did, he did tell them the word has made you clean, mm -hmm. but he got on Peter. This is what the Holy Spirit does now. Mm -hmm. By walking in the Holy Spirit, the whole, we're actually walking with Jesus. Yeah. Jesus loves us way too much to see us fall back into sin because it's going to affect our relationship with him. Mm -hmm. So, no, you, you're right. That's, this is for the believer. It's for the believer. Um, and we're to a daily examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. All daily examine yourself and uh, see what, check yourself. It's always good to check yourself where you are spiritually. Whether I'm, am I going to distant, Lord? I guarantee you, we, don't, we, we really don't. Our desire is to be always constant with the Lord. But we... Up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, I'm up, I feel like I'm up in the clouds of the Lord one day. I'm, I'm walking, and the other days I just don't feel like it, you know. We all have those days. You can't trust your feelings. Yeah. Exactly. Because they're, <laughs> they're fickle. Your yes. feelings, <laughs> your feelings will change from one day to the next. I want him to say that again. So, yeah. Say that again, brother. Just telling uh, Ken we can't trust our feelings because they're so fickle, and those are the same words that I've told my wife over and over and over again when she feels up and down and up and down. Don't trust your feelings. They're all too fickle. All right? <laughs> yeah, they'll change from one day to the next. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's the difference between happiness and joy. You know, that happiness that our depends on the circumstances. Everything's going great. But the next day might not be so great. But the joy is, it is you have it no matter what the circumstances are, you know, whether they're good or bad. And so we, I want the joy of the Lord. I have joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart. Remember that song? Yeah. So we want to have joy. And uh, we can have that. That's available all because of the Calvary. Amen. So praise God. But there will be some... Like I said earlier, they will not, that will be ashamed, you know. These individuals are believers, and they're saved, but they, they won't lose their souls, but they'll lose their reward. They'll lose their reward, and that's eternal. We don't want to lose our rewards. We want, we want them, you know. Those are, those, are, those are eternal rewards. And so we always want to be ready for him, draw closer each and every day, I want to read something shortly, what Brother Swigert writes in his commentary concerning that. It's very, he says here, if our being what we ought to be in Christ is predicated 
on our faith in the cross and, and demands, which demands some knowledge of the cross considering that the modern church is almost cross illiterate. The modern church today is cross illiterate. Where does that lead the present body of Christ? However, the Holy Spirit is in the process of remedying this situation. In other words, he is in the process of making this foundation known to the church. You know, that was the foundation that Paul preached. The cross has always been uh, the foundation of the church. It's just the church modern, strayed from it. You know, we need to come back to the, the, where we were before. It's what, it's, what we're, it's what the Apostle Paul is telling us. As the church now is in the last great apostasy, it is also in the last great outpouring of the Spirit. We're in the last great outpouring of the Spirit. The outpouring says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. What was that we just prayed about this morning? People come to the saving knowledge of Christ during these last days, that we're here to be witnesses of His grace and His mercy. Let our light shine before men so they may see your uh, good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Amen. 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 That's what we want to be, a light on a, a city on a hill we don't put our light under a bushel. Well, we let it shine, put it on a stand, then it may give light to everyone in the room. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Boy, praise God. That's amazing how the Holy Spirit will remind you of things. It wasn't in my notes here. So praise God. So knowing and understanding that one cannot be saved unless one places faith and trust in Christ Jesus, which he has done at the cross, we learn this great outpouring is intended to pull the church toward the cross. The finished work of Calvary. This is what this outpouring is all about. Bring the church back to its moorings. The church has lost its moorings. That's why the book, I got tongue tied. The book of Isaiah says, the, in Isaiah chapter 1, the head is sick and the body's full of sores and no medicine can mollify. The head is sick, the church is sick. It's sick. And I, when I heard, first heard that scripture, I didn't realize how, I didn't realize it. When you're in that false doctrine, you don't see the stuff that's how sick it is. But when you're out of a few years and you can see how bad it really is, I've, I found out how really sick, it, how bad it is. It's terrible, especially since I've been here the last six or seven months, learning all this <coughs> false doctrine that's going on. I guarantee I wouldn't have known about the Florida Faith Doctrine. And I wouldn't have known about it the church I came out of from before I came here. Because they weren't talking about it. They're not talking about prophecy. No, no, they don't. They don't. Not, churches, you'd be amazed how many churches don't talk about anything in the Book of Revelation. They don't want to talk about it. They don't. And so, that's that's this is what this great outpouring is all about to draw to draw the church back to the finished work of Calvary. Praise God. Amen. Verse twenty-nine. We're almost there. Finished the chapter. Since you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does righteousness is born of him. I'm going to read that again. If you know that he is righteous, speaking of Christ, you know that everyone who does righteousness is born of him. We're born of him. We do righteousness. You know, Jim, people need to understand what righteousness means. Go ahead. Jim, what, what that means is that we're doing right in the eyes of God. That's what it means. Yeah. Just doing right. Do the right thing. You know? Walking in walking in him, walking close with him, doing the things that walking in the spirit is walking in righteousness. You're not, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Uh, it, that phrase, if you know that he is righteous, you could translate it this way. It could be since you know that he is righteous. That's what the righteousness of Christ is what really Christianity is all about. As God was perfectly righteous and always has been, however, when the righteousness of Christ is addressed, it is not because of his deity, but rather as a man, Jesus Christ. That's important. The right, because in and of ourselves, we had no righteousness. He was all man and all God. He was very God and very man. And so he's, when he speaks of righteousness, it's, it's righteousness as of man, rather, but not at... Let me, I'll re, let me rephrase that. It is not as speaking of his righteousness as deity, but rather as a man, Jesus Christ. 
When God became man, he did so as the last Adam to carry out a particular purpose, and that was to gain back the righteousness that Adam had lost in the Garden of Eden. We, he lost it there. And so he says, and so every man that's born of a woman, is, is, we have that Adamic nature inside of us. We don't have any righteousness whatsoever. I'm going to read to you what Brother Swigert writes in this commentary concerning that. This, I've enjoyed this commentary and reading it. I've learned so much out of it. So I've done, but let me just read to you. It's very important. He says here, about 1,500 years before Christ, God had given the law of Moses. He had given the law to Moses. This law was his standard of righteousness, and man was demanded to keep it in every aspect. The, law, the, excuse me, the upshot was that man could not keep the law and in fact, every single man failed. We couldn't keep that law. There's no, there's no way we could keep the law of Moses. Jesus had to address that law and keep it in every respect. Thank goodness he did. The scripture says, but when, out of Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Yeah. Whew, I'm going to read that. That's powerful. But when the fullness of time, just at the right time, was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. He had to be, had to be that way. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? It would be, uh, um, I lost my train of thought now. Have you already have that problem? You lose your train of thought? <laughs> anyway. Yep, yeah, right. I'm close to the other end, though, brother. <laughs> 70 something. But uh, he says here, the law contained righteousness, but for his righteousness to be had, man would have to keep the law perfectly, which, as stated, none ever did. But Christ did keep it perfectly, thereby gaining its righteousness and doing so on behalf of fallen man. However, there was another matter of the law to be addressed, referred to as the curse of the broken law. As stated, every single human being had broken the law of God thereby bringing upon themselves its penalty, which is death. On behalf of mankind, Jesus suffered the curse of the broken law by going to the cross and dying in the place of man. In other words, he became the substitute of man. So he not only gained a perfect righteousness by, by perfectly keeping the law, but he also addressed the curse of the broken law, thereby settling its claims and doing it so once and for all. For every single soul who accepts Christ and what he did on behalf of fallen man and did so specifically at the cross, the perfect righteousness, the perfect righteousness which belongs to Christ is thereby granted to the believing sinner. We gave him our sin and he, and he gave us his righteousness. That's what the old sacrifice, the burnt offering did. He, he gave us his sinless, we gave him our sinfulness and he gave us his sinlessness. That's what I'm saying. That's the burnt offering. Exactly, a sin offering. Amen. God can only accept a perfect righteousness, and, there, and, there is only, and that was which of Christ, which he will freely give such, righteous, such righteousness to all who will believe, irrespective of what their past has been. Isn't that good news? We have a perfect righteousness, unsullied, uh, not contaminated, but a perfect righteousness. His righteousness betrothed, given to us. Not because of anything we've done, but simply by faith in the finished work of Calvary. Amen? We couldn't earn it, my friends. We, there's no way possible. No. Yeah. And if you, you, there's no, you can get no amount of money you could give or any good works you could do to earn your salvation. But what's also true is that you, any amount of good works, you, can't earn a, you don't earn sanctification that way either. No. People think, well, I can work, you know, I'm saved by faith, but, but sanctified by sweat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saved by grace first, then through faith, yeah. and through Jesus alone. Right. Right? Right. Because it's Jesus that calls us. Yeah, saved he by faith, yeah. draws us to him. We, right. don't, we don't go to him. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's true when people say I found Jesus because he did find Jesus yeah. he found you yeah. <coughs> to the, the 
Bible clearly te teaches the doctrine of election. Mm -hmm. And that means God knew you would respond. Now, a lot of us Arminians get a little worried about that because we think we're teaching Calvinism. We're not. You can still believe in doctrine of election mm -hmm. without believing in Calvinism. Mm -hmm. You didn't get saved because God one day saw that, hey, you know what? I think that person believes. Mm -hmm. God knew you would be born before the world even existed. Imagine that. Exactly. And he knew you would make that confession of faith before you were even conceived. Mm -hmm. So he elected you before the foundation of the world. And, Christ, and that's why it says Christ suffered and bled and died for us before the foundation of the world. Because God knew who would respond by faith. And this is why Romans 8, 28 and 29 is very important. That if those he elected, he what? Called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. I know. That's the walking of the spirit, the glorified. Mm -hmm. All walking of the spirit is, is we're going to do things that glorify God. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. I remember that song. Uh, that uh, was it? Uh, Je I found Jesus. Remember that? I'm, I don't know if y'all remember that song. It was popular back in the 80s and 90s. I, I remember it, but I said, no, I, I, he found me, you know, he, he, he sought me. I, I wasn't looking for Jesus at all. He found me, praise God. He found every one of us, thank goodness. Oh, my. How many of y'all remember the day you were saved? Oh, my. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm the same way. Right. It's not the saying the prayer that saves you. It's, what, it's, it's at, at what's in the heart. If you say it from the heart, if it's sincere, if you really mean it. You, saying the prayer is not going to save you. But if you believe what you prayed, then that's, say, that is what saves you. For out of the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So you have to believe it in your heart. You know, just saying it doesn't mean, you know. And not shaking the preacher's hand on Sunday morning saves you either. And joining the church saves you either. You know, water baptism don't save you. You know, I don't care what they say, it don't save you. The thief on the cross said Jesus was baptized in no water. So he was saved to go into glory land with the Lord. Praise God. All right, yeah. So Amen. Praise God. But how do I get off on that? But Anyway, that, so we, we can't earn our sanctification either is what I'm trying to say. The same faith that saves you is the same faith that sanctifies you. You know, your works don't produce faith. Your faith produces works. A lot of, and people get that confused. It's not your works produce the faith. It's your faith produces the works, the good works. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. What you want? No, it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I, I, I don't mind anybody saying. I, lo I love, I love dialogue. I love people sharing. It's just I learn too. So, without y'all sharing, I don't learn either. So I, I, we all learn from one another. Um, let's see. Where am I at? Okay. I know it says that phrase. You know that everyone that does righteousness is born of Him. That, that, that the one, this proclaims the fact that if one is, is, truly, is truly born again, he's righteous. Because he's, he has the righteousness of God, and he does righteous, and he will do righteousness. Well, the question may be asked, well, how does one do righteousness? That's a good question, isn't it? How does one do righteousness? Well, you do right things. It's like Pastor was saying, you do what's right. The, he must un, the believer must understand that every single thing he receives from the Lord comes totally, completely through the cross of Christ. You know, we're to say yes to the cross. Understand the cross has made everything possible. You know, this, that's why it has to be the object of our faith. And then the Holy Spirit will work mightily within our hearts and lives to help us to do righteousness. He's the one that does it on the inside of us. Not, it's not of ourselves. He's the one that does the work, helps us to do righteousness. He does that. That's his ministry. And if we ignore that, and place our faith in other things, we'll end up doing unrighteous things, unrighteousness. So the opposite is true. So we always want to be in the position of doing righteousness so that when he's appear, when he does appear, we're ready. 
We want to be doing righteousness. Amen? Paul said in Romans 7, I read this last night, and it said, he says in Romans 7, verse 18, For in me dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. In me, in of myself, I dwell. It's only because of him, not because of me. And so he said, there dwelleth no good thing. That speaks of the flesh. In my flesh, there is no good thing. Your flesh it pertains to all what you can do, your capabilities, your, machina your machinations, your, your abilities, your talents, and things like that, which you, you can do, which fall far short of what, God, what the Holy Spirit can do in and through us. And so we need to rely on the, that's why it goes all the way back to the correct object of faith, which is Christ and Him crucified. And we'll end up doing righteous, righteousness. <clears throat> it says here, now we're finally in chapter, verse three, uh, chapter 3 of 1 John. You know, I was looking back on my notes yesterday, early this morning. I said, when, how long have we been in chapter 2? <laughs> Two months. Well, I started on March 13th. Sunday, March 13th, and here we are, May 15th, so it's about two months now. So we're, we're finally in a new chapter, verse, chapter 3 of verse 1 John. And I love the way it opens up, the way the, uh, the one John opens it up. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, that therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Behold, I'm going to read that again. I love that. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God. Therefore, the world does know, knows us not, because it knows him not. You know, the world doesn't recognize us as, a, as sons of God, do they? They, don't, they look at they. you tell them I'm a son of God, they're like, they'll give you the, uh, the weirdest look. You know, we don't go, they don't recognize, they don't appreciate, you know why? Because they didn't appreciate Jesus was unaccepted when he, in his daily walk, when he walked. His own, his own, he wasn't accepted in his own hometown. They tried to kill him. At the outset of his ministry, and, and uh, we, we read that on uh, Wednesday night in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. You know, he, he went in the synagogue and read the book of Isaiah, chapter 53 to them, and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they all sat quietly, sat in the sanctuary, looked at him, and all the gracious words that he said, you know, and he, and he goes on to that, this, you know, physician, heal yourself. Do hear what you did in, the other, in your other places, you know. And he goes on and corrects them and all this and reprimands them, you know. And they, they threatened to kill him. They threatened to take him to the brow of the hill because of what he said. That's how religion works. Religion works. To, religion kills. It does. It literally kills people. It'll kill you. I'm not talking spiritually. I'm talking about physically as well. They'll kill you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hypocrites. Yeah, hypocrisy. You know. And so, their religion will kill you. You know. So, uh, uh, and so they're trying to kill Jesus at the very outset of his men from the very beginning and then on out and so being behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us you know that ca the, it captures the, the born again believer with wonder you know he calls on his readers to take a look at the wonderful love that brought us into saving knowledge of Christ brought us into the family of God imagine an orphan we we're orphans we have a parent and we have a home now and we have, we're accepted in the beloved we're, we're not orphans anymore, you know, so we've been adopted into the family of God. We all, well, we all remember all too well what we were before we were adopted, don't we? Amen. I mean, we can all remember, we can go back to what we were like. And uh, we've, I can say all of us have come a long way, at least I hope so, you know. Hope we've come. I'm not the same person I was 46 years ago. You know? I was, I'm not the same person. I'm not perfect, but I'm growing each and every day. And that's what we want to be. We want to grow closer to him and to help develop through the spirit in, my, in, in our lives. That's what I pray for personally. I, I want the, the, the Holy Spirit to help develop the fruit of the spirit in my own life, to help me want more in love and patience and be long-suffering. 
and it's all done simultaneously. He doesn't say one, take one, I have more love than I do, I have patience. No, they're all, they grow at the same time. You know, so I want to develop the fruit of the Spirit in my own life, you know, so that I can, don't let the little things that irritate me, you know, you know what I'm saying? The little things rub us the wrong way, you know, so we want to walk in love. <clears throat> We, but we all too remember, we all well remember how ungrateful, rebellious, vile, unholy creatures that we were. And we stand amazed at the love that would adopt us into the family of God. That song, I don't know if y'all heard it, Amazing Love, How Can It Be That He Would Die For Me? I wish I knew the words of that, but I was thinking of that song. That's it, that was it, yeah. Amazing Love, Amen. Before the cross, God could not readily bestow his love on us, as he now can. But what Jesus did at the cross made it possible for God to draw nigh unto us and for us to draw nigh unto him. That's the benefit of the cross. If there's nothing else we get, no benefit other than that, we've got plenty. If all you get out of, if all it was was salvation, that's more than enough. Praise God. Praise God, you know. You know, that's one of the benefits of Calvary right there. Amen. He saved my soul. The phrase that we should be called the sons of God. We're, we gain that by adoption. Romans 8 verse 15 says, But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, which is done so because of, excuse me, which we cry, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit enables the child of God to call God the Father. We can call him our Heavenly Father. We pray to him, Heavenly Father. We can pray to him. This, and that's all because of the result of the born-again experience. We've been born again, just like Jesus said. Born again. Praise God. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Vernon had brought to my, remembry, my remembrance that um, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that, that was more than enough for us, right? We, we, anything else, yeah. <laughs> anything else is icing on the cake, but that's more than enough. We're gonna sing a song, Jireh, this morning, which it means the Lord is my provider. And when Jesus died on the, on the cross of Calvary, that was more than enough right. that I could expect. Exactly. Go ahead. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't ask for anything more. No, you can't add to it. Uh, can I add something? Sure. I heard, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, one, of my, one of the preachers, I, he said to try to add to what Christ did on the cross for us would be like you walk into this banquet and you have the best of food, steak, the best of fruits and vegetables, all lined up, served on, you know, silver platter, everything else. It's all there for you, and you turn and say, but I would like to have a bologna sandwich. Well, that's what we do today, brother. That's what the body of Christ, that's what we're doing now. We're, we have a smorgasbord before us, and we're wanting a bologna sandwich or peanut butter and jelly. You know? you know what? That's what happens when we add our works to the finished work of Calvary. What an insult it is to God when we do that. We're really slapping God in the face. We're slapping Jesus. We're, that the cross was not enough. That's what we're really saying. That's what the modern church is saying today. The cross is not enough. We got to do our. We got to do a part. But Calvary was a complete work. No, nothing needs to be added. Nothing. Zilch. Zap. Nothing. We don't add nothing to Calvary. It's a completed work. Satisfactory. God satisfied. He. he he satisfied the claims of the broken law that was, that was against us. The handwriting of ordinances that Colossians talks about that was stood against us, nailing it to his cross. It stood against us, that, that the law, but he fulfilled it. Oh, okay. I'm getting too excited. Preaching. Okay. I get excited. Praise God. I do have a little preaching in me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. 
I get excited. When you talk about the cross, I get excited about that, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, I love it. I just love the study of it. The world, the world, the word, therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. The world does not recognize us or acknowledge us as sons of God, just as they didn't recognize Jesus as the son of God. The world was made through him. Was, was, he was in the world. The world was made through him, and the world did not even know him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. John 1, verse 10 and 11. Since the people of the world have nothing in common with the children of God, they have no fellowship with us. At least they shouldn't. Therefore, we have, they have no intelligent appreciation or understanding of us. You know, that reminds me, uh, when I was working, oh man, I'd go in all these homes and businesses, and I did this for a long, long time. And my, we had our, Jody and I had our own business. And uh, I had the opportunity, one of the benefits of this job that I had, business that I had, was I could go and I visit all kinds of people. I, I just, I, that was the most interesting thing to me was about, I loved the people more than I did the job itself. You know, because I enjoyed fellowshipping with them and talking with them, talking about the Lord. But it gave me opportunity to talk to the Lord a lot of people. And Christians, man, you know, can you imagine being out in the world 12 hours a day, 10, 12 hours, and, you, and you're just drained? Uh, you, I'm sure you know that, Pastor. And you're drained. And you just say, oh, man. But when you run across a believer, it just, whoo, it's like a breath of fresh air coming on you. It's like they fellowship. You talk about the Lord and they pray. And man, it's just like a, it just encouraged me. Just a word of encouragement they gave me. And it was such a blessing. And I, I, that, that, whatever they said stayed on my mind throughout the day. And they encouraged I always remembered that. I said, thank you, Lord. That, that person came at the right time when I needed it. So many times that happened to me. And I'd go home and share it with Jody, you know, what brother, sister so-and-so. And, and uh, you know, just... It's like they became more my family. I was closer to them than my own members of my own family. Right, right. I love those people. I said, honey, I would sure like to go back and visit some of them, you know, in Jacksonville and just, just say hello to them. Just, but, uh, but it's just like family. It just, we should be closer to one another than we own members of our own family. Am I right? That's right. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. this would be a home away from home. That's right. That's right. This would be our home away from home. I... I fellowship with you guys more than I do my own family. You know, I really do. And uh, I love it. We have like faith. Like faith. Because we love Jesus. Amen. All because of him. I love that. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Oh, man, that is so good. That is so sweet. But I, I just enjoyed that. I said, my goodness. I was so excited. I was just like, I had a, it just gave me a, I had a spring in my step right after that, you know. I was ready to go. Praise. Verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Wow, that's powerful. Let me read that again. Behold, now, not in the future, now, N-O-W, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Beloved, here's another term of endearment he has for us. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, you know, this would, that he tells us that even though there will be a tremendous change in the resurrection, still we're, you and I are just as, as much a son of God right now as we will be at the resurrection. I'm going to say it again. You and I are just as much a son of God right now as we will be at the resurrection. There's no degrees of salvation. It's just you're gonna, what you are now is what you'll be at the resurrection. And so <clears throat> your glorified state it hasn't, doesn't, refer, doesn't refer to your spiritual man, but your physical state, your physical man. We'll be, we'll be, more, we'll be um, we're not going to be any more sons of God then as we are now. And that's the, because of the cross. The work that which carries, which, excuse me, the work which faith in the cross carries out presently cannot be improved upon 
the sacrifice of Christ is a total and complete work, just like I said to you earlier. It's a complete work. So, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, meaning that it's not yet fully realized that what we shall be as regards the glorified body. We don't have our glorified bodies yet, but we, ours will be just like his. Won't have no blood in it, you know, but we'll be able to do the things he does. We're finite. He's infinite. And so, therefore, the, the glorification has to do with our physical body, not the spiritual body. We, in fact, when a believer enters heaven in a sinless state, he's not catapulted ahead to an absolute spiritual maturity in an instant of time. We're going to grow in, the, we're going to grow in this, my friends, over and is, is for time eternity. We're not going to be a spiritual maturity all at once. It's going, we're going to grow in it. it grows in, we grow in the likeness of him through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be all throughout eternity. We'll never equal Jesus, for he is fi infinite. We're finite. But we'll be like him as, as far as our physical being, our physical part, our bodies will be. We'll be glorified. For we shall see him as he is. Tells us that not only at the rapture will we be able to see our Lord as he is now, for our physical lives couldn't see him, but we can only see him in a glorified state. You can't see him in his physical body. It would consume you. Right. It would it'd destroy you. So we can only look at, look at him in a glorified state. But you and I look at him truly right now by faith. We, we look at him by faith right now. And that's what pleases God, by faith. And so <clears throat> we know that by that the rapture we'll look at him in all his glory and due to being glorified ourselves, we will have the capacity to do so. You know, isn't it interesting? I was thinking about uh, uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John went up, Jesus, to the Mount of Transfiguration. And he went up on the high mountain. And Jesus was transfigured before him. There was Moses and Elijah with him. And Jesus was in his glory. I mean, the, the brightness of his glory. You know, and, and, and Peter says, Lord, we would, we would like to make three tents for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. You know, he didn't know what he was saying. You know. But they wanted to stay up there in that glory. They didn't want to come back down that mount. I'm sure they didn't want to come down there. They want to stay up there with the Lord and Moses and Elijah. You know. But you know, Israel never recognized his glory. Neither did the other disciples. They, never, they, they, they kept it to themselves, those three. They didn't tell, share with the other disciples what went on at the Mount of Transfiguration. But you see, when we, when we have our glorified state, when we get our glorified bodies, we're going to see Jesus like that. I, I believe we will be in his glorified state. Amen. Verse 3, and this is important. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I'll read that again, verse 3. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. What is the hope he's talking about here? A hope of eternal life, the blessed hope. We have that blessed hope. Titus 2.13 says, you know, we have that blessed hope. Exactly. Walking in righteous holiness. The blessed hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, uh, but we have this hope. We purify ourselves, don't we? We walk, we, you know, it's not meant to be taken in the sense we can purify ourselves within our, ourselves, but as we, John said in John 15, 5, that apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, we have to be abiding in the vine. And that whole, as long as we abide in the vine, the Holy Spirit will do the purification. He'll do the perfect purifying process. So all we can do is provide a willing mind and, ability, and an obedient heart. Amen. Willing mind and obedient heart. Willing to be, do what he says and, and a lean, to that, lean to the finished work of Calvary and be willing to do that. Amen. Uh, be obedient. That must be in the heart of every believer in order for the Holy Spirit to bring, back that, bring out that intended result. The purification is a work of the Holy Spirit within our lives. He works strictly on the principle of the finished work of Calvary. All that is demanded of us is this belief. Faith. That's all we can give him is our faith. 
We can't do anything. We can't purify ourselves. We're totally inept. We don't have the capability of doing it. If a man attempts to pur- excuse me, if a man attempts to purify himself by his own efforts, his ability and strength, it will lead to spiritual disaster. You'll get frustrated, and you'll quit, and you'll walk away from God, which is what Satan wants: spirit, your spiritual d- destruction. And the Lord doesn't want uh, quitters either, because he don't. He doesn't like quitters. Right. And if you quit, hey, that's on you. Yeah, it's on him. It's not his fault. It's our fault. You know exactly. If you won't quit, he won't quit. That's right. Amen. I got two minutes. <clears throat> the phrase "even as he is pure" places Christ as he's our example. He never had to purify himself. He is pure. We have to pure have ourselves purified. He is pure. He is our example. Uh, with us, it's a gradual process. It's not one slam, hunk, slam dunk. You know? It's, a, it's a, a gradual thing. We learn a day, day by day, day by day process. And like I said earlier, we're going to be doing this even in, into eternity because we're finite human beings. He's infinite, but we're finite. Verse 4, and I'm going to stop here. I'm going to read this verse, and we're going to stop pick it up next week. That whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So we're going to pick up there. I'm going to stop right now because it's almost quarter till. And we're going to pick up on verse 4 next week. And I hope you all enjoyed that. I've, I've learned it a lot. It's just, uh, I hope you all as well. But I'm going to pray, and then we'll close up and get ready for our part two of our services this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for the study of the first John, Lord God. And Lord, we want to be those that grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father God. We desire to be, to walk in holiness and righteousness before you, Father, in these last days. And I ask you to help us to grow, Lord, to lean on the cross, Father, the finished work of Calvary, Lord, not, not in and of ourselves, but what you've already provided for us, Lord. Help us to lean on you. And, Lord, we ask you to anoint the service this morning, Lord God. We ask you to, to anoint Mike and Bernadette as they lead us in the worship, Lord, to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords and his majesty, Lord. Help this worship take us to the throne room, Lord God, and to, wor- and to lift up. Lord, this is, not of our, this is not about us, but it's all about Christ and what he's done for us, Lord. And we ask you to anoint Pastor this morning with a message you prepared in his heart to give to us, a word in due season. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name that I do pray, amen and amen.